Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning to all of you. My background is a journalist, so I'm not a scientist or scholar, and my presentation will be really based on my observation of the Indonesian politics and the business world uh, in my professional career as journalist for the last 35 years. Um, this is my topic, business and politics mix well in Indonesia. Um, so it's still very much related to what uh, Professor Gould has given. In fact, maybe some of the uh, things that I will say is a kind of repetition uh, from what he said. Um, let me just start with... Okay, I'll be speaking in both Bahasa and in English. Uh, again, because I have a problem with some of the terminology. One of them is perselingkuhan business and politics is a fact of life. Uh, originally, I wrote, uh, well, Professor Go uh, used the word marriage, but I think it's more than marriage. I was going to use adultery, but adultery does not describe the immorality of uh, this uh, mixing between business and politics. And I think the word perselingkuhan best describes what I'm trying to suggest here. Adultery, because in English, I think it maybe is, is, has to do with culture. Adultery is, is, there is no immorality there. But I think perselingkuhan, because we're in Indonesia, in our culture, there is this uh, question of immorality and a little bit of, I guess I would say, hypocrisy. Uh, because perselingkuhan happens, but I think we, and we criticize, but we don't do much about it. So, perselingkuhan between business and politics is a fact of life. I think already Professor Gal mentioned that. Let me just, I'm not making judgments here. I think I'm going to leave, you, leave to each one of you to make your own judgment. Uh, but uh, this is, like I said, it's, it's the reality, yeah, kenyataan dalam kehidupan politik dan bisnis di Indonesia. It's a fact of life. Number one, I'm sorry, it's a little bit, a little bit small. The evidence is, well, we have President Joko Widodo, right? And he is the first president in Indonesia with a business background. Of course, he was not elected because of his business background. By the time he became president, I think his, he was more seen as a very uh, competent uh, leader. Uh, he governed in Surakarta for two terms, and then he became governor of Jakarta or short uh, to two years. Uh, but that was his credential. I don't think he was elected because of his business background. But it's not the same thing with uh, his uh, vice president, Yusuf Kala. I think he's purely from business background and the reason why he was chosen. First time uh, by President Gusdur as Minister of uh, Industry and Trade because of his business background and because of the influence that he commands as a businessman. And then later on, he became the Minister of People's Welfare under Megawati. And then he ran uh, as Vice President, as running mate for Yudhoyono, and he got elected. And then he ran again in 2014 as running mate for President Jokowi, and he was elected. He is purely from business background. Of course, he has had some experience in Golkar, but I think his main strength comes from the fact that he's a businessman with some clout and power. Uh, of course, looking uh, forward to 2019, we have Sandiaga Uno. Again, uh, very much from business background. He has had uh, one year, less than one year of experience as Vice Governor of Jakarta. But he's coming into the presidential race in 2019 really as a businessman with ambitions for, you know, for, for office. Again, I don't make any judgment. I think this is a fact of life. It's good or bad, I think we, we leave to everyone. <laughs> And, and the voters to decide whether it's good or bad. Uh, second, business is now very well represented in the cabinet. This has been a tradition, I guess, uh, going, back, going back to the Suharto years, but even more and more so uh, in, in the last few administrations. Um, in the current cabinet, we have Susi Puji Astuti. Uh, her background is a business. Uh, Engar Tiasto Lukito, Erlangga Hartarto, Andi Arman Sulaiman, and Thomas Lembong. Uh, before, we had Rahmat Gobel, of course, the Panasonic Group. 
Okay, uh, and then, of course, like I said, it started under Duren Suharto, but uh, only in the, in the, I think, in the fourth of fifth, fifth cabinet uh, pembangunan of uh, uh, President Suharto when he started to recruit businessmen into the cabinet. The first one was actually uh, Siswono Yudo Husodo. And if you recall, his background was uh, you know, a businessman from the port property, and he was named as Minister of Housing. You cannot get a more conflict of interest, someone from the property business running as Minister of Housing. Uh, the next one, I recall, uh, is Abdul Latif. Uh, he is a very successful businessman, very highly regarded. He was named Minister of Labor, Minister of Manpower. Again, you know, the conflict of interest is not an issue. Uh, he's a, he's a man, but he deals with uh, uh, union, with labors. Uh, I, I think at the time, the, the, the perception is still better him than a military. Yeah? Because in those days, most of the, as I think in the past, most of the Minister for Manpower came from the military because of the, the issue, the political issue that they were concerned that labor were very much you know, on this left wing or uh, uh, communist uh, oriented, and they need a very powerful minister of, a powerful person to be the minister of manpower. And I remember pa Sudomo was long time a minister of uh, manpower. So when pa Abdul Latif was named as minister of uh, manpower, people would say, well, what's wrong with that? And then, and Kadin, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Good talk about uh, lobbying. Uh, and uh, Kadin is the lobby on behalf of the business community in Indonesia. And I think over the years, they have become more and more powerful to the point that they can put their, 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 their persons or their chosen person in the cabinet. Uh, of course, the biggest one was uh, Abu Rizal Bakri himself when he became the minister of uh, coordinating minister for the economy. Uh, but I think since then there have been others who actually was, was holding the cabinet position on behalf of Kadin, or at least someone who, to whom the Kadin can actually uh, talk and probably try to get uh, to influence. But those, you know, having ministers in the cabinet and lobbying group Kadin, those are. Uh, Transparent. We see them and we know them that they're doing it, and and we know that they get uh, uh, they're, they're successful in influencing the, the 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 administration. The one that is actually more disturbing is the one that is less visible, and this goes back to the times of Suharto. We know the the, the relationship between Paharto and Lin Siulyong. Uh, Bob Hassan and few others. These were lobbyings conducted behind the scenes. We don't know then at the time. Well, we understand it was happening, but there was no evidence. It's hard to prove. But we know from the fact that these companies, these groups, uh, they became larger primarily because of the connection with Paharto and other powerful uh, figures. That happened very, uh, and like I said, in the background, it's not transparent. Uh, is it still happening now? That's the question. I'm sure it's still happening. It's just very difficult to, to prove. But uh, this is the one that's probably more uh, disturbing because it's, it's behind the scenes. OK, I said it's, it's a fact of life. And I think it's the reason is because it's the political system. right? Uh, politics uh, give you access to power. That, but, but politicians, they need money to make them to, to get into the office, to get elected. And then business, they need access uh, to power, and business has the money. So that, that marriage, or that, that perselingkuhan, as I would say, is uh, it's regarded as natural, as probably inevitable. And even more so now that we have democracy, because uh, a democracy, uh, when you run for office, for president, for seats in parliament, for bupati, uh, governor, you need money, right? And that, and this is why you know you can raise money, and then 
uh, if, if you happen to be rich, probably that's not a problem. Uh, but if you are not rich, but you have political ambitions, you have to make deals with your sponsors. And this is again something that is not transparent, but something that uh, we know it happened. Uh, just look at the number of people who, uh, uh, DPR members or DPRD members who have go been going to jail uh, by KPK. Uh, the amount of money that they are stealing. And, and this is like an indication of the, 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 the influence of money. Uh, basically, these uh, politicians, because they spend so much money in getting elected, they have to get the, the money back and make some profit. And this is where, I guess, the, the money or the transaction uh, happened in the, in the background anyway. Well, it's working perfectly. Uh, Suharto and the big conglomerates, you know, I mean, some of you remember the Chukong system. Uh, it's, it's, it worked. I mean, the economy developed uh, under Suharto, and there were businesses actually prospering, and the nation became uh, more prosperous under Suharto. Of course, after, uh, after 35, 35, sorry, yeah, 35 years of Suharto, the whole system collapsed because of the massive corruption. But I think it worked at the time. This is probably the political decay that Professor Gal mentioned. Um, military and the conglomerates, again, we know that uh, there, there is a relationship between the military because of the power that they have, and the conglomerates or the businesses, they need to have access to power, and that marriage on that Brazilian uh, took place. BUMN, again, this is the state companies, they have uh, access uh, uh, to power because, of their, their, because they are state companies, and they work with politicians together and for their mutual benefit. Uh, Golkar, uh, in the old days when there was, the only, well, there was one of only three political parties, is the party for business people to, to go. Right? Nobody was actually going to the other two parties because they are not part of the government and they, would, they remain always in, in opposition. So it's not surprising that many business uh, people, they join Golkar because they know that once they go Golkar, they can get closer to power and therefore get benefits from that access to power. Uh, but since Reformasi, we, the, we have multiple, multiple, multiple political parties system, and some of the political parties came because of they were supported by uh, powerful money uh, from businesses. Uh, so Golkar is not the only political party that has the support of the business people, but I think there are a few other parties that have emerged since then also backed by um, um, the business people. Um, candidates, I already mentioned candidates running for office, they need money to finance the expensive campaign. They would get themselves indebted. I know some of my friends, they run, <laughs> they had to borrow money, they had to put mortgage, their, their houses, and they borrowed from, uh, from the banks. Very expensive. Uh, I think that was a kind of uh, a tariff. Eh? If you run for uh, Bupati, you have to make some, spend so much you know, bill billion rupiah for governor is even more, I think for president is even higher. Um, and then this is already something that Professor, Professor Gal mentioned, that since reformacy, more and more business people are now joining politics. Well, they have the money, and the, the system is open, so why not, instead of uh, paying people, paying politicians, to, you know, to negotiate on my behalf, why not myself become a politician? And this is, the, I think this is something that, uh, a trend, uh, again, that is allowed and probably even encouraged by the political system. Now, you may recall in 1998 when Suharto's uh, regime collapsed, we had this slogan, KKN, eh, anti-KKN, uh, it's anti-corruption, collusion, and nepotism. In fact, uh, Yudhoyono was elected primarily on that platform because he was the one that came across as the most uh, uh, as the right figure uh, to, run, to run the campaign uh, to eliminate KKN in Indonesia. And of course, in, also in 2004, KPK was launched. Uh, the, the deliberation for the KPK happened under Megawati's uh, presidency, but it was signed and started to work under Yudo Yono. And, um, and sure enough, KPK did a great job. Uh, they went after uh, big time corruptions and they had actually put in jail uh, politicians, bureaucrats, business people, 
senior police officers and prosecutors. We also learned that some of the results from the KP works, KPK works, the collusion practices between executive, legislative, legislative and judiciary. This is what I would call uh, threesome <laughs> perselingkuhan, perselingkuhan tiga, uh, tiga, tiga, tiga bagian. If you add uh, business people there, well, it's, it's, not, it's not a foursome, it's like an orgy, right? orgy of corruption. Again, in spite of the great work of KPK, we almost every week we hear new stories, new, new arrests by KPK of corruption, politicians uh, and, and judges. Almost every week we are entertained by the KPK with all these stories. So, and that raises the question, is this uh, arrest and putting in jail of corruption really having any effect or not? And if you look at the work of the, the uh, KPK, they had been successful in going after corruptions, but I think the question of nepotism is still very much alive in Indonesia, it's still happening. And of course, collusion uh, is harder to prove, but we know it's happening. Okay, so the question is, uh, there, there's always a question about uh, government or president, are they pro-business or they're anti-business? Of course, all, almost all, I would say all presidents in Russia, they are always pro-business. They are never anti-business, by, by the very nature, because they need the support of the business uh, and, and, and they work in collaboration. Uh, business friend, pol friendly policy, again, uh, of course they will. The question is to what degree are they business friendly? Uh, and this is again the, the question of the, the, the how strong the lobby from the, from the uh, corporate side and how strong is the government in resisting the pressures. Uh, we understand there is a tension sometimes between the finance minister, Sri Mulyani, with the business people. Uh, she is very tough uh, minister. She has been going after the tax money. And that's, I think that's, that's the kind of uh, relationship that we should be looking at. The, the powerful lobby, but also it's really up to the president and his finance minister to resist and giving too much away to the uh, business community. And then the, the, the question is, if it's pro-business or business-friendly policies, it's really a question who gets the benefit. Definitely not all the business people, but some of the business people. The closer business you, your business, or the, the closer you are to the center of the power, the more likely that you're gonna get the benefit of you know, uh, friendly policies. Conflict of interest, sure, but then, so what? Yeah. Nobody cares, it's, it's a fact of life. It's normal to have ministers from the business uh, background to be minister of trade, minister, minister of uh, industry, minister of agriculture. Nobody questions that, but the question of, but what about the potential conflict of interest? What about it? Nobody asks questions, people say this is a fact of life, let's just move on. And impacts, I think Professor Gal already also mentioned the impacts. I'm just going to list some of the, from my own observation. Number one, the impact, it leads to unfair competition. Right? Uh, the business friendly policies are only friendly to certain groups at the expense of the others. Not all the time, but I think most of the time. Uh, so there are few winners and many losers uh, in the business world. I'm not talking about Later on, we'll see that uh, the consumer side, they, they also lose out on, in this, uh, this game. It creates space for rent seekers, yeah, because there's opportunities uh, then there uh, to make money. Uh, and rent seekers are basically those people who have uh, access or they're cl close to power. This is where nepotism takes place and collusion as well. It creates layers of middlemen, we call it Contractors, Rekanan, uh, that's a system in, in all government agencies that you have to be included, you have to register as Rekanan. And many of the Rekanan that I know, they have no factories, they have no business, they have no competence. They only have access to the people who make the decisions. And once they get the contract, they would subcontract them. 
and sometimes even the subcontractors would subcontract again. And this is how business in Indonesia is, is run. Was uh, in the uh, and Suharto, I still believe it's still maybe to not to the same degree because there's more comp competitive bidding, but uh, s things are still happening. Uh, it creates a long chain of pr uh, between producers and consumers, uh, and then producers and farmers would be squeezed out. Or the farmers, in the case of uh, agriculture, they would be squeezed out and get the lowest amount of money for, for their products. And then the consumers at the other end, they will have to pay the highest price. And those in the middle, the middlemen, the contractors, they are the ones who make the biggest profit. They have no risk, and, but they just get pure profit. And then if there's protectionism, uh, if you are close to, if you have friends in the government, you can ask for favors you know, and need protection from competition and all those things. The non-tariff barriers, the creation of the Tata Niaga in many strategic and lucrative industries. Uh, again, more prevalent under Suharto, I say under Suharto, almost all commodities are regulated under so-called Tata Niaga. That has changed, but I think some have been retained, and we can talk about it later. So here are some examples. Uh, I'll just go briefly. And petroleum import, at one time there was only one company that can import uh, petroleum. Uh, and I think Jokowi is the president who actually got rid of that system. And now at least Pertamina can import its own uh, petroleum. Before it was just one uh, person or one company with the privilege and making lots and lots of money at the expense of the state and, and the public. Uh, rice trade. Again, a very sensitive issues. Um, the rice trade, uh, I came, up with, came across a story that the chain uh, between the farmer and the consumer, there's seven levels. And some experts say that there's too many. Uh, I think four would be fine because of the nature of the, 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 the commodity. But I think four should be fine, and seven is too many, meaning that at each uh, level, at each chain, people are putting up the price. And, and sure enough, uh, there were uh, studies that show that Indonesians, we pay the highest price for our rice, more so than anybody else around the world. Uh, same with beef. Uh, beef is a, a cartel uh, in collaboration with Australian beef exporters. And again, uh, at, to the exclusion of other exporters, as India, I think Brazil, Argentina, they want, also wanted to export, and they said they can actually give Indonesia a better price. But the, the lobby was very powerful, and at the moment, they, they have allowed Karbau uh, 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 from uh, India a limited amount. But that's as, as far as. Again, I think we are paying too much for our beef, and much more so than our other, other countries. Pharmaceuticals, again, this is a very uh, 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 controlled uh, industry uh, with few players, Indonesians as well as foreigners. And I know uh, India has been trying to come into Indonesia. But India, uh, and we pay so much for our uh, medicines, much more something like to the tune of 10 or even sometimes 20 times more than what other countries would be paying. And India is a producer of very inexpensive, actually good medicines, uh, and then, but in Indonesia prevented with putting all these uh, non-tariff non barriers, and we end up paying too much for our drugs. Uh, the last point is tobacco, cigarette. This is probably the, the most powerful uh, uh, lobby group in, in the country. Uh, one example, just uh, on Monday, the uh, Minister of Finance announced that the plan to increase the excise of tobacco has been cancelled. Uh, and uh, even, even as uh, the government is uh, short of money, uh, we need the money because of the, rupia, the fall of the rupiah. And it makes sense, and there was a big debate that it makes sense to actually increase the excise on tobacco because people still buy cigarettes, even though it's more expensive. Uh, but somehow, 
there was announcement on Monday. No, no explanation. It was just decided that it's not, they're not going to increase the price of uh, the excise, of, meaning the price of uh, tobacco and cigarettes will, will not change. If you're smokers here, you should be, feel very glad. <laughs> Okay, the question is, is it legal? Well, it's nothing illegal. Yeah, there's collusion, uh, uh, the ones that we know anyway, uh, nothing illegal, but uh, except the ones that, that KPK had been able to find, and then they would find, uh, they would uh, arrest and process the case. Um, sorry, it should be legal. Well, it, it's, yeah, it is legal, of course. Is it immoral? Again, who cares? Nobody talks about morality in business, right? Only in religion, a little bit in politics, we talk, but again, I think it's more hypocrisy than anything else. But I think the question is ethical. This is probably a more, a more important uh, thing, that something that we can actually help fix. Uh, the answer, is it ethical? Of course it's not. Uh, and, and looking at the impacts, uh, that's, we can say it's definitely not ethical. Okay, I'm, this is my last, last slide because I'm talking to a group of accountants. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to leave you with this uh, uh, few issues. Whistleblower, I would not recommend that. <laughs> I know accountants, you have access, uh, you know a lot, and I think you also have this, uh, I don't know, you have the account, accountant client privilege, like lawyer and client privilege. Uh, but you, some of you understand, remember the case of Vincentius Sutanto versus Asian Agri. Okay? He tried to blow the whistle. He is the one who ended up in jail, uh, actually 11 years. I think Tempo did a good, a good story on that. But the end was having a tragedy uh, that the person who blew the whistle was the one who ended up in jail. So I would not recommend that unless you want to be a hero and then you know, get Tempo to help. Uh, I think it's where we can, or what the accountants can do is actually in, in uh, improving code of ethics. And the last point, I think through the professional associations like ICAEW, you know, maybe even out of this conference, uh, can come up with uh, recommendations on changes on policies, regulations, to prevent or at least to minimize the practices of collusion. I think the paper from Professor Gao was very great about the steps that we can take. That could be uh, uh, one document that can actually be discussed as the ICA, EW, and Erlanga University come up with recommendations uh, to, to the government. Thank you very much.